Hello, welcome to another Dragon Plus live stream. I am your host, Bart Carroll, and with me again is John File. Hey. Welcome, John. Well, thank you. <laughs> uh, we've got our cans on today, so we've got a couple of guests that we're going to be Skyping into the show. Already on screen right now, uh, Stephen David Wark. Hello, bonjour, hi. <laughs> Nice. Uh, what's, uh, let me give a quick uh, little announcement here before we jump right into it. Make sure that we've got plenty of time to talk about your exciting news that just went out today. Uh, so again, Dragon Plus Livestream, where we discuss more of the content heading into each issue of Dragon Plus, our free online magazine. Our next issue will be coming out, I believe, next week on or around February 20th. So look for that on iOS, Android, or as always at dragonmag.com. Uh, of course, we also talk about the design, the development, and the running of your D&D game content, and especially where we can take a more visual approach, take advantage of our live stream platform. And we might have a uh, quick trailer to show today as, as part of that. So uh, two guests, as mentioned, uh, Stephen has graciously uh, accepted our invitation to join us today, followed by uh, Adam Koble from uh, Roll20, Roll20 Presents, coming up at about uh, the, the half hour so. Uh, why don't we just get right into it? Because uh, Stephen, you've got some some uh, very cool and exciting news that uh, that hit the interwebs as of this morning. Isn't that uh, correct? That is correct. I'm uh, very uh, thrilled, really, to uh, share with your audience that uh, Dungeons and Dragons is coming to mobile gaming platforms. Uh, in uh, in the near future, uh, Warriors of Waterdeep is the name of the game, and we had a press release. We've gotten some coverage online, and we've got game trailers to share. We're looking forward to uh, having players uh, try the game out. Super cool. So, uh, for folks that might not be uh, necessarily aware of of who you are and uh, Ludia itself, could you kindly introduce uh, the folks at Ludia? Ludia is a game studio based in Montreal. We are entering our 11th year uh, of operation. We uh, started out um, creating games based on uh, game show licenses like the, uh, like the Price is Right or Family Feud. And since then, we've uh, evolved and changed what, uh, what kind of games we've made. And um, you might know us from the Jurassic Park Builder, Jurassic World franchises, or um, Dragon's Rise of Burke. Now we're uh, heading into uh, a very exciting partnership with uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Uh, very cool. Uh, so Warriors of Waterdeep, I, right. that's uh, currently the, the title that is yeah, uh, currently the title. subject to, uh, to possible. It, it's looking very, very certain that this is the title of the game. Okay. Excellent. <laughs> I know you've been working uh, much more closely with uh, the man seated next to me over the last uh, several weeks about this. So. Hey, Steve. <laughs> hey, John. Hey. So when you mention uh, Warriors of Waterdeep as a mobile game, uh, what, what, what uh, sort of gameplay, what sort of features did you want to bring to, to the mobile platform through uh, Warriors of Waterdeep? Well, we wanted to, um, you know, let players play, uh, you know, have a D and D experience that uh, suited sort of the mobile gaming um, uh, lifestyle or habits. So, you know, lots of uh, complete short sessions, as many of them as you want. You in this game, you'll be controlling a party of four characters, and uh, you know, going through, going on a dungeon run, raiding dungeons, defeating the monsters using your uh, spells and special abilities to the best of your uh, strategic and tactical ability. Uh, trying again, if it doesn't work out quite so well, those uh, gelatinous cubes will surprise you with how hard they hit. And um, have, a, have a great time. So uh, the announcement has, has been up on, on various articles and websites as of this morning. I was reading it on, on VentureBeat uh, myself and, and looking at the uh, the current uh, roster of sort of race class combinations, and it was uh, it was cool to see uh, some some known figures, including uh, Farida, the Tiefling warlock from uh, Aaron M. Evans. I'm I'm kind of uh, uh, fond of Sarvin. <laughs> He's in the the, the comic book. Uh, yeah. He was just in the Frost Giants Fury uh, huh. um, a comic book that Jim Zeb did uh, did for us um, this past year. So. He's, he's super cool. It's like my second favorite uh, Minsk in that comic book. Uh, uh, what was the process like sort of filling out the roster? Were there, there are certain uh, folks that you had an idea? We, we like this race, this class, this, this persona that might be out there? 
Well, we absolutely wanted to make sure that we covered all the core races and classes from the player's handbook because that's you know the, the core D and D experience, and uh, we wanted to make sure that everything was distributed um, you know in that list equitably. So we just we had our dream list of uh, of what we wanted, and then we you know started talking to John and other folks at uh, other folks at Wizards to come up to see which characters were available, and uh, you know we're. There's such a rich body of characters across all the, you know, the comic books and the board games, and uh, and the novels that uh, we're we're spoiled for choices. <laughs> the really hard part is cutting things down, and uh, you know, debating with the with the artists. Can we really draw things like that? And you know, I regularly ask them to do the impossible, and they deliver. So you know, we got to the um, we have good prospects there. Right. Yeah. Um, uh... It was uh, what was it? It wasn't uh, this past winter, but the, but earlier we brought Richard Witters up to the Lydia mm -hmm. offices, and um, and we had a long art discussion about uh, about the characters in 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 the game, and and uh, there are some really really good ideas that they came up with. Um, the concept artists at Lydia are are fantastic. Yeah, um, that's true. Uh, so the whole art team is awesome, but but some of the the concepts they came up with uh, the Russian is that right? Um, yeah. Uh, 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 Wizard is is just super cool. Mm. So um, uh, there's a lot of good stuff going on in this game. I'm, intri I'm intrigued if we can ever steal a peek at some of that concept art. We can put it in, uh, in Dragon Plus or uh, find other ways. Oh, twist my arm. I'm sure we can do that. <laughs> yeah. So I, I have, how, is it, uh, how was it working with Mr. John File and the folks at Wizards of the Coast? Now, there's, oh, there's been... clearly a softball question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It's uh, you know what it's been a, it's been a real joy right the lines of communication have been really open we're all excited by each other's ideas what we bring what we bring to the table you know again asking for crazy things and being told that crazy things are possible that's great and and, and vice versa it's been uh, it's been a lot of fun it's been uh, a real treat seeing all your artists in action and uh, and bouncing ideas off of them and getting a you know a strong sense of what uh, what goes on behind the scenes for um, for uh, upcoming events for why characters uh, ended up the way they did in publication? It's been uh, it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, um, I think uh, one of the the uh, um, uh, the really strong uh, parts of the relationship is is Steve's own past with with TRPGs. And uh, um, Stephen, do you want to talk a little bit about about uh, your past uh, RPG experience uh, in, the, in the tabletop realm? Well, I don't. I could go all the way back to when I was in grade four, and the teachers told me I'd never make a living doing this. But oh, I just did. <laughs> um, but uh, I mean, I've always been, uh, you know, into uh, board gaming and uh, role playing games, uh, you know, on and off uh, through my career. And uh, for fun, I uh, managed to uh, do some uh, freelance work with uh, Wolfgang Bauer from uh, Open Design and Cobalt Press, doing some. Uh, uh, rule book layouts, adventure book layouts for uh, his projects back then, and that kind of really got me into uh, 3.5 in a big way. And I was looking at um, looking at, at rule sets as the same way that I would look at uh, other games or other uh, pieces of uh, user interface for software, and uh, trying to get the the most fun, most usable products out there. So it's been uh, it's been fun to uh, meet people at Gen Con. Uh, or through the various forums from um, uh, from Wolfgang's group and, and other folks, and then you know spin it out from there. Right, and it's this uh, this type of experience that that helps um, understand the language of D and D. Mm -hmm. Right, so when when we have a, devel a developer, a, a digital developer that's coming in and wanting to make a, a D and D video game, having that kind of background uh, establishes channels of of communication that somebody without that kind of context. Um, won't understand, right? So, so uh, having Steve in there to to really kind of uh, understand where we're coming from when we're talking about the Sword Coast and Waterdeep and what's going on in that that region, um, and then uh, talking to his his uh, fellow, are you Ludiaites or what? <laughs> we're Ludians. Ludians. Okay, yeah, so Ludians. That, that's uh, um, uh, that's that's. Um, an important point of uh, clarification. Right. Yes. Very good. And I have to say that you know, you know, my personal enthusiasm is, you know, on, on some occasions dwarfed by the enthusiasm from the other team members. They, mm -hmm. There's a lot of D and D fans in there, and we all, you know, uh, know uh, what make know that D and D's fun, what makes it fun, and so mm -hmm. we have that. Uh, we put a lot of positive energy into 
the decisions that we're making for the game to run. All right. There are some stories that came out when um, uh, they announced to Ludia that they were going to do that D and D game that uh, that that several people decided to jump ship from their own projects and try to, to get into the D and D project. Um, but uh, but I think we got the best of everybody there at Ludia. Thank so. you. I would agree. <laughs> Present company accepted. <laughs> I want to hear more. You were you were role playing back in the fourth grade and uh, taking some flack from that. From uh... <laughs> you know, shared desks with uh, with other classmates, and I get find little notes from the teacher saying, "I'm going to throw you in the dungeon if you don't clean up your half of the desk." <laughs> things things like that. This was back in the days of uh, you know first edition AD and D. Rogues Gallery was a book that I always had tucked into the textbook when I should have been paying attention in class. You know, it's a I'm sure it's a tale as old as time. <laughs> too busy, too busy playing. Uh, it it's is. Although I was really good at integers, so there you go. Nice. That so, go minus ten AC was easy to manage. So, like decimals, not so good. Big burn. Decimals, not so good. Percentages, <laughs> can leave those behind. No. No. Just those integers, just just were right there for you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so again, for folks tuning in, uh, we're talking to Stephen David Wark from uh, Ludia, talking about Warriors of Waterdeep. It's early days yet. The announcement was just made uh, this this morning. Uh, from from uh, and where can folks uh, go to find out more information now if they're interested in, in pre-registering for the game? If they're... Oh, uh, we have uh, we have our website up and running at uh, WarriorsOfWaterdeep.com. And uh, we have the full slate of social media mm -hmm. uh, uh, available on Twitter, on Facebook, on Instagram, uh, YouTube. So you can, you know, search on those platforms as well and uh, be directed to our pre-registration link. So if um, you kind of lean over to your, there you are. Look at that <laughs> pre-register there, Warriors of Waterdeep.com. Well, we can only see on. Uh, we've got a, a we've got a good view. We were just discussing before yeah. before the stream for folks wondering why we look like we're looking above you. It's so that we can see Stephen. Right, the, the Stephen's screen. head is floating above the camera. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, it's like one of those robots with the screens for for a head that wander around and. Yeah. Like, Don't reveal the secret. <laughs> yeah, I know. Uh, so we've been talking about the game for a little bit. Uh, we, we do have the 90-second uh, trailer. Uh, I'm going to look over to Palm. Why don't, we, why don't we show that so folks can get a good look at uh, Warriors of Waterdeep, the game we've been talking about, and we'll come back and uh, see if we've got another, another minute or two of questions so before we uh, let you uh, depart from, from our, our live stream today. All right. So we'll see if this is good to go. All right, we're ready to go. So we're going to roll uh, the 90-second trailer from Warriors of Waterdeep. And we're back. That uh, was awesome. That was very cool. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so again, awesome. Stephen, thank you for, for uh, bringing us the, the 90 second trailer, a bit of uh, Warriors of Waterdeep. Uh, I mentioned before that uh, still early days, we'd love to have you on Dragon Talk, back on Dragon Plus, and, and as the development continues so we can really dive more into uh, the, the creation and the, the formation of the game and, and what all is all going to entail. Have we talked about release dates yet? Uh, if we haven't, we should again. Okay. <laughs> 
So, <laughs> so when can folks uh, generally look for the game? I know a, a specific so date uh, isn't announced, but we're aiming for a soft launch or you know a, a beta at the uh, end of spring. Okay. Okay. And, well. uh, that's about as uh, that's about as accurate as I can be. End of spring is as the. Uh... It's the exact <laughs> uh, science of game development. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Uh, so, soft launch around the end of spring, as you mentioned, uh, folks can, can uh, pre-register now at uh, warriorsofwaterdeep.com. That's right. Mm -hmm. And everybody who pre-registers uh, will uh, receive a, a special Laryl gift pack when the game goes live, which will help supplement mm -hmm. their, uh, you know, their starting inventory. Nice. All right. Well, we'll definitely have to have you come back out and, and, uh, and talk more about this in the, yes. the future upcoming weeks, I think. It'd be awesome. Absolutely. So yeah, again, uh, Stephen David Wark from Ludia. Uh, thanks so much for, for telling us a bit about Warriors of Waterdeep. Uh, game just announced. We were privileged to showcase the, the, the trailer, but look for it, warriorsofwaterdeep.com and on all the various social media platforms as, as well. Thanks for having me on your show. Thanks for letting me play in the sandbox. It's oh, a lot of fun. absolutely. Uh, so for, for the folks watching, uh, we're going to take a very quick break. Uh, we're going to be Skyping in Adam Cobble from Roll20, Roll20 Presents, uh, to, to talk more about his live stream game and endeavors as well. But for now, we bid an adieu to, uh, to Stephen. Thank you so much for your time coming on the live stream. All right. Thank Thanks you, Stephen. We'll be talking. <laughs> So I believe we're going to run a quick... been counted in so we must be back on the screen. Mr. I feel live. <laughs> uh, we have our second guest is already sharing his screen, Adam Coble from uh, Roll20 and Roll20 Presents. Uh, really quickly before we, we jump into our conversation, Adam, I did want to mention a quick uh, welcome to folks that might have carried over from Mike Merle's Happy Fun Hour. Uh, this was episode three he, uh, this week. He's been increasing his audience each time, so <laughs> chat was getting crazier and crazier, but we, we, uh, we love that. Uh, he showcased a bit of the Rogue Acrobat and then the Giant Soul subclass. Uh, so for folks interested in watching design in action, Mike Morell's Happy Fun Hour uh, immediately preceding this show, 1 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays moving forward. So welcome. Uh, and in any case, uh, we would love to welcome on the stream now Adam Koval. Hello. Hey. It's me. <laughs> How are you doing today? I'm great. I'm doing so good. This is a, this is a week of heavy, heavy Dungeons & Dragons for me. I've, I've, I've got four four-hour episodes of one show 
and then we did a three hour episode of of Tomb. Plus, we had a round table on the weekend, so I'm just like D and D on the brain this I, week. I was saw, I saw the round the round. I was going to uh, ask a little bit about the round table. Yeah, it's like 21 hours of D and D. Yes, yeah, it's 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 nuts. I have one one eight hour live show. I'm flying out to Texas for that, oh. and then two four hour shows of the of the same one, and then we did Tomb as well. So. I love it. I'm happy. I want more DD. <laughs> Just give it to me. I want all the Dungeons and Dragons. Give them to me. You got it. Uh, so, uh, for <laughs> folks that that uh, might not be aware, uh, Adam, you DM for the Roll Twenty Present Show, which normally streams on the D and D Twitch channel uh, Fridays yeah. from one to five p.m. Pacific time. That's right. Yeah, it was. It used to be. I think we did like two two to five. But we were like, no, we need more. Give us another hour. So it's four hours now, which is super exciting. And we were we were more than happy to have you uh, on, mm -hmm. on as well. Uh, so so really quickly, just to explain why we're screen sharing. What what is it that folks are looking at uh, at the moment? Yeah. So if if folks have had the opportunity to tune in uh, to Roll Twenty Percent's Tomb of Annihilation, uh, they will recognize this screen. This is the screen we spend most of our time on. Uh, this is the module version uh, in Roll Twenty in the virtual tabletop. Of Tomb of Annihilation. This particularly is the the player map uh, of the uh, of the peninsula of Chilt. So um, yeah, so that's what we're taking a look at. This is the screen that we use to run uh, run our game. I, and I did want to mention it normally streams Fridays one to five. Uh, there were a couple of uh, travel dates uh, thrown in there. You were streaming as early as this Monday, correct? Yes. Yeah. Our most recent episode was Monday at 9 a.m. Pacific. Which, if you live in Europe. We always get, when we do the Monday early shows, the European folks are like, yay, show I can watch that's not in the middle of the night. So we'll pretend that's for you, Europe. <laughs> but the, the, the U.S. players were in need of a desperate need of a cup of coffee. Yeah, yeah. All of, all of my Pacific Coast PCs were just, just coming out of a long rest, and they're a little groggy still. But that's, that's okay. We had the warm-up time in the first hour. So. And, and started right up with a, uh, it was a skeleton fight right from the beginning. Is that right? Yeah, it's so this party has a problem with plants. Every time there's an encounter with plants, it seems like they just about get wiped out. We've had some trouble with assassin vines. There's been some other plant-related problems. The team does not have a botanist uh, on hand, so <laughs> it's yeah one of one of the uh, the higher lanes that you don't always add to your party, but maybe for to, to <laughs> right. move annihilation, it makes yeah. good sense. So yeah, yeah, I. Uh, I almost unleashed tons of plant puns right there, with me, but uh, I managed to restrain myself. Good work. Yeah, Good work, guys. It's, 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 yeah. It's I wouldn't have I to have. leaf the show. Uh, yeah, yeah. In response to you. No, all right. Let's not go. Let's. We don't have a lot of time. Let's not go there. <laughs> we don't want to play that game. So, uh, again, Roll Twenty presents usually on Fridays, uh, but you did stream Monday, so we'll see you again next Friday as as yeah. we pick up the campaign again. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so, so really quickly for folks that might not be uh, uh, watching, and you should, uh, who, uh, who are the players in your campaign? Yeah, so I've, I've been playing with this group for uh, a while, and for some of them, uh, we've played multiple versions of D&D. Uh, of &D. Uh, one of my players, uh, Dave, mm -hmm. he, uh, he first joined the Roll20 Presents crew when we were back playing uh, Moldve Basic D&D. &D. Oh, so we did, wow. a, we did a run of the, uh, we took a run of the Caves of Chaos. Wow. And uh, and that was I think the first time that we played a D and D variant. But we've done uh, Adventures League. Uh, we we took a trip through Karaptus's Funhouse, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and that was good. But the Tomb uh, we've been playing for about it'll be 20 episodes uh, next Friday, uh, and I'm playing with uh, yeah Dave Dave Human, uh, Blue Jay, uh, Distracted Elf, and uh, Commuting Crow, my friend Andrew. Um, and uh, yeah, so far it's been it's been great. I I love a good hex crawl. And it's one of those things that looking <laughs> at it, looking at it, you wonder like, you know, jungle misery, is that going to make for good viewing? But so far, the audience has been really into it, like sh shouting at the players for accidentally getting throat leeches, <laughs> worrying over rations. It's been it's been really cool getting to stretch a, a variation of the D&D muscles that we don't always get to do when we're playing a more kind of drama focused campaign or, a, or more of a dungeon crawl. Yeah, there's there's something about the Tomb of Annihilation campaign that definitely lends itself to some of those I I, I guess I would say old school threats and considerations, whether it's you know the, those environmental hazards or right. rationing a, a gear and equipment and uh, finding you know porters and things along those lines. Sometimes mm -hmm. getting there is more exciting than than the actual end. Uh, spot that you're going Well, to. I mean, I know for me, when I showed my players this map for the first time, uh, their immediate response was, oh, we got to clear all the hexes. I got to co I got to cover ah. the, the whole jungle. We want to see the whole thing. 
Interesting. Uh, so there is there is definitely, uh, and I, I talked about this a little bit on, on Twitter when we first started the campaign, there's definitely an exploratory angle that you don't see that often in, uh, in Dungeons & Dragons, uh, these days, anyway. Uh -huh. um, and so it's really cool to go back to that. Uh, it's a, I, got a, I got a soft spot for the hex crawl, so it's, it's really neat to see a new, a new generation of players uh, get into, uh, into that style of adventure. So, so they, were, they were treating it as a bit of a fog of war, where they, they, the goal was to clear away as much of it, to, to, to map the entirety of, of Chult as possible. Right, right. And, and you know, we, we see on the, on the map, like, there's some areas around the, the outside edges, right, mm -hmm. the Miscliff Mountains and Kitcher's Inlet and Refuge Bay. Like, those are all available to the players right from the beginning. But all of the other, all of the other clear out hexes, uh, that's, that's player progress, right? Mbala and Orlunga and down here in the Aldani Basin, all of that is player work. That's stuff that they went in and, mm. and wandered around. And now they know those things are there. So it's uh, it's been it's been cool. It's a nice way on top of your character's experience points to measure your progress. To say, oh well, that this is where the Aldani Basin is. We know that because we went there. All right. Yeah, I, I, it reminds me, I was once given a gift of a world map, and it had the sort of scratch-off coverings to it. So oh, every country you visited, you scratched it off to review. Oh, you mean a real-world map? A real-world map, okay. yes. Oh, wow, well, I never got that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I like it. I like that uh, you, you're employing something similar with this as well. Have, have mm -hmm. the players, uh, have there been moments where you've revealed something dramatic underneath one of the hidden squares that they were not expecting one of the ruins one of you know one of those abandoned forts yeah i mean i think i think probably ironically maybe the the biggest sort of drama moments in the in the game didn't come from the inhabitants of the jungles of of chult but of its visitors uh, we have a, a couple of episodes sort of mid-season uh based around camp vengeance mm -hmm. and the players and their characters did not get along with the Order of the Gauntlet very well. And so that that was a discovery that unlike the poisonous snakes or the flying monkeys, they it went it went to a very challenging place for them. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, it's been it's been really fun looking forward and saying, okay, I know that they can travel X amount of hexes per day and they might run into these things. But as a GM, the the hex crawl, by way of all of the tables that are built into Tomb mm -hmm. and automated in Roll20. Um, it's as much a guess for me because I might know that they're on their way down the Social Star towards Mbala, but what I don't know is if they're going to randomly encounter anything, and if so, what are they going to run run into? Is it going to be Zantarum agents, or is it going to be a dinosaur, or is it going to be the aforementioned flying monkeys? Um, and it keeps it keeps it really exciting for me because when I play, even though I get to see you know the the GM version of the map and I get to see where everything mm -hmm. is. There's context in between, right? Where I get to learn what the players are going to discover as they delve deeper and deeper into the jungle. Do you leave yourself notes uh, on the GM map to to remind yourself of where everything is, or do you just keep notes off to the side? Yeah, so I I keep uh, I keep most of my maps. I'm I'm that's one way in which I am I am old school. I I have a notebook that I keep some of my notes in. Um, but what's fun is that when I when I run the show all of the audience gets to see my view of the map. So they're they're like mm -hmm. my sort of co-GMs. So occasionally I will have to, like they'll see an adventure uh, encounter before it comes up, so I'll roll, and all of the audience will be like, uh-oh, what's, like they're getting scared, like something big is coming, and then it, I release the, the Tyrannosaurus on the players, and uh, we have this sort of dramatic irony with the chat. And so occasionally I'll use the map to communicate to them. The players will be talking about, well, what if we use fire on this creature? And I'll just be ominously circling the fire resistance on the monster's <laughs> character sheet. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah, there, it's a good plan, but here, take a look, chat. Have a look at this, because it's not going to go the way they expect it to. <laughs> So, like in, in Vegas, where you've got the guy with the you know the the signals getting called into him, you know, counting oh, cards right. to the mm. next table. You have to be careful, I imagine, of somebody watching the stream. You and can't do that in Vegas. Signaling into uh, to one of your players what's actually <laughs> taking place. Yeah, chat has pretty good pretty good discipline. Uh, our our mods our mods are on top of it uh, during the show. Um, but I, I think it. It's interesting because I think most of the time when we see streamed games, they're from a player perspective rather mm -hmm. than from the GM's perspective or the DM's perspective. So it's really neat for me to invite the audience behind the metaphorical screen because I can share all of my notes with them. They can see me building encounters as we uh, as we move, and uh, they can watch all of that happen. And I think it, it demystifies some of the process of being a game master. So I can show off my my toolkit of tricks, so that when someone wants to run a game of Tomb of Annihilation uh, using their own Roll Twenty account and their friends, uh, they have some some context. They can see some of the macros I've used mm. and uh, some of the tricks. 
And there's a, that adds an extra element of showmanship, I would imagine, as well, right? So, so not only is are you designing and they're watching the, the play, so that's two two depths of of uh, showmanship that you're 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 doing in your show. Yeah, I've gotten I've gotten very good at spinning the plates of like dungeon mastering and then running the virtual tabletop instance and then also producing the show. Uh, it's it's taken some practice, but I, I I got it I got it down to a science now. <laughs> But it's yeah, it's super cool to be able to show people like yeah, you can you can do all this. You can play D and D, you can play it on a on a, a virtual tabletop like Roll Twenty with your friends wherever they are, and if you you're really brave, uh, you can you can stream it to the internet and people can watch. Yes, uh, these days we uh, we definitely are encouraging of of exactly that. We love the fact that many 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 more people are are streaming their games than than ever before, and we love finding the games on on Twitch as well. So. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's great stuff, and, and we, uh, for folks, so let me ask that, then, for folks that yeah. might be potentially interested for, for uh, streaming uh, their D&D sessions, what sort of technical advice might you give? You're using Roll20, the tool sets, you know, what camera, what microphone, what software are, are you, uh, if yeah. you're able to say? <laughs> sure, yeah, yeah, so, I mean, I'm, I'm personally not a, a great example for, like, entry-level streaming, because if you want to just get into it, don't emulate what I do because it's expensive, but it's my job to, to do, be a broadcaster. So mm -hmm. for me, it's a, a bit different, but I think that to be successful in terms of coherently telling a story with your friends that somebody might want to watch, uh, either on, on Twitch or, or as a podcast or on YouTube, mm -hmm. it's really just about making sure that everybody in the group can be heard, right? So you can get a, a pretty decent entry-level mic uh, for around $100, $150. Um, the webcam that most broadcasters use, uh, there's a Logitech webcam that is, again, like 90 or $100. Um, and then beyond that, it's really just about teaching yourself and your group to consider that the audience is there. Mm -hmm. So remember, don't talk over each other. Um, we, we make a point in the, the, the show to be a little more didactic. So while you know, uh, Distracted Elf, who plays uh, Ishii Snaggletooth, the fighter, well, Elf knows all of the rules for her character and can rip through them real quick, uh, I asked her to, to take it slow, right? Be like, all right, I'm rolling my attack, roll the attack, mm -hmm. say I'm rolling damage, I'm using this feat, I'm expending my second wind, and we, we talk it out so that people know exactly what's going on. Because if you're playing really quickly, an audience, especially an audience that's just tuning in, they may not know what's happening, they may not be as familiar with D&D as you are, uh, and so taking that extra time to, to explain to the audience uh, what's going on uh, can be really helpful. Same as calling out uh, results on dice, because sometimes people aren't necessarily watching the stream, they're listening to it, mm -hmm. uh, and they have something else open in another window, so instead of just saying, I roll my attack, and then the damage, you can say, like, oh, I got a 16, and you can call that stuff out. Uh, it helps make the show more accessible to uh, folks who might be absorbing it in a, a different way. It, it reminds me of uh, whenever we go into uh, usability studies for the website or something like that, and we have the candidate going through things on the screen while we're watching behind the glass and all that fun stuff, we always say, you know, go ahead and talk through what it is that you're doing out loud so that we have a sense of what you're doing and why and, and can follow along. And, and yeah, I mean, for, for me and for this this show in particular, it's it's especially useful because what I want is for people to emulate what we're doing. I want people to look at the show and say, oh, the module's really cool and uh, it makes a lot of stuff about GMing Tomb of Annihilation really easy and I, I can do this. So it behooves me to say what I'm doing. Like I'm clicking this token and I'm hitting the space bar so we can track how far the token's moving and I'm dropping the token uh, and I'll, I'll try to make sure that I'm, I'm explaining what's going on as we do it so that folks can see how easy it is with, uh, with Roll20. So speaking of which, I mean, you're using the, uh, the Roll20 tools. Would you mind giving us maybe a, a, just a quick look at uh, some of the, the features that you take advantage of as, as a DM? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so uh, you know, as we were saying before, this is the this is the probably the most used screen because of at least for now. We'll see when they get to Omu. But. And I, I should I should interject. Some of your players may or may not be watching now. If you don't want oh, to I spoil tr anything, <laughs> I trust I trust my players. I trust them. They they are they are excellent at this. And what's interesting about this group before we kind of get into it, because I think that is a thing. Um, this group is really good at moving from the. You know we're 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 doing the role playing stuff and we're joking around with with Volo and Portnianzaru, and then a fight breaks out 
and it's a serious one, and now we are playing Dungeons and Dragons, and we're very specific about what we're doing, and we're we're tactical about this, mm -hmm. and uh, and so for them, the the challenge of like playing the game, of choosing the right feats, and, and moving in the right way, uh, is a big part of it. Um, and anything that I show the audience, you know, d the players might have a little foresight if they were to pop into chat, but. I'm not worried. I can still take them. <laughs> I got assassin vines for days, so right. I'm not worried. I suppose um, that you can always buy a copy of the uh, adventure as and just yeah. Really. Well, in in a in a recent episode, <laughs> what was funny in a recent episode, they they, they did run into into Volo and Port Nianzaro, and they bought a copy of Volo's guide. Uh, and I, I said, <laughs> you know what? Now that your characters own it, you paid the fifty gold. Uh, anything in that supplement, you can just imagine your characters have access to. So you're you're you've read Volo's guide to monsters, and now you know those things. And um, I always believe that the the players with the with more information are going to play the game better, and that's going to make for a better show. So I'm not too worried about them getting spoiled. All the real big deep secrets, they're still they're still way in the dark. So plus it's Volo. You don't actually know if he's <laughs> yes <honest> exactly <laughs> or, or accurate in, in any in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So uh, so this this is the map that we use to do the uh, the sort of day to day travel in in Chult, whether they're on their way to adventure, or they are they are running back home to Port Nianzaru. Uh, you can see that they have their own their own little marker down here. And so what we do every day uh, is the we we begin a travel day with the cleric casting uh, bless on whoever is going to make the survival check mm -hmm. to uh, to gain the party. They're going to tell me what hex they're moving into, and then I've built some some uh, macros that let me run through all of the all of the rules of that. So I've got a little wayfinding button down here that brings up. My uh, my macro, so I can choose: is it one player by themselves? Do they have a guide giving them advantage? What's their skill bonus? Right. So we'll say they have a, a seven, and we can put that in. And then we can say: are they going normal? Are they going fast? Are they going slow? And then I can say what terrain they're moving through. So say they're going through the jungle, and when I submit the roll, uh, my little are they lost macro tells me that they got a 17 against a DC 15. And you can see because it's yellow here, this is secret for me. Well, me and for my chat. So chat knows if they're lost, but the players might not. Hmm. And then I can move their I can move their hex token. And you'll notice when I move their, uh, their token, there's another token uh, underneath on the GM layer to show where they actually are. So I can move them, I can move them around and say, okay, you're, you're in the jungle over here, but actually, you're over this way. So as they as they maneuver through the jungle, chat and I know the the real secrets, but the uh, but the players get kept in the uh, in the dark. Um, and so the the same is true when we look at a uh, at a dungeon map. So if I take a look at, for example, I think I have a player token in Fane on the Night Serpent. So we'll zoom out here. So in the dungeon map, it's the same thing. You can see all of the all of the tokens are already added. All of my miniatures are are on the table. Um, but if I look at it from the player perspective, all of the uh, all of the tokens they wouldn't be able to see are grayed out. And I can take a look at uh, all of their stats on the token, and uh, we can have them moving around in the uh, in the dungeon. So both kinds of maps get used. We have maps in the uh, in the system for all of the maps that are built into um, into the adventure. Mm -hmm. So like as you saw when I was navigating the toolbar, uh, we have Chult, Nanzaru, um, the various places in Chult. They all have their own maps populated with tokens. Uh, and then I have a few uh, additional sort of random encounter maps that I've grabbed from the Roll20 Marketplace. So a generic jungle or two or three or four or five. So that if I roll one of those random encounters on my, uh, say, my jungle encounters table, and I suddenly need somewhere to encounter a were tiger in human form, uh, I can uh, I can pull that map up, throw it out into the adventure, populate it real quick with tokens either from the monster manual or from my own prep, and uh, and then snap over to that screen. And during the entire during the entire section, uh, chat is able to watch me building these random encounters as they are having a discussion about whether or not to approach this this character or whether to uh, back away from the grungs they see in the jungle and that sort of thing. So it gives me both the, the tools for dealing with the random stuff as it comes up, but then also all of the, the preset qualifiers. So things like the Fane of the Night Serpent and Port Nianzaro and what have you. And while you're building this, uh, your players are happily talking amongst themselves, planning on how they're going to approach the encounter? 
Yeah, yeah. So so the players, you can notice there's a little red ribbon on the player's map of Chult here. So I can move around. I can go over to Beach by Night, or I can take a look at a Taz Mahaha, and they're still looking at the map of Chult. Uh, they, they may not even know that an encounter is coming mm. because, again, it's in yellow, so it's a random encounter that only I know about. Mm -hmm. And what's been really fun about doing the, the random encounter stuff, this is my favorite thing about random encounter tables in any variation of D&D, is trying to find context in the adventure at large for the encounters in the moment. So in any other group, this were tiger in human form might be, um, it might be any, any random were tiger. I could just come up with a name, we could use it. But because I know that previously in the adventure, the characters uh, interacted with uh, Azaka Stormfang, I could say, oh, this sounds like Azaka maybe they run into her in the jungle. Uh, we had that happen with a, um, a group of Zentarim assassins who were looking for artist Simber. Um, I knew that there was a named, particularly named Zentarim in the uh, later parts of the adventure, and so I just tied those two encounters together. Very cool. Man, where tiger in human form is an awesome Twitch handle, if it's not already <laughs> taken. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, it's like 25 letters or something. Yeah, well, I didn't, not, a, not, a, not a short one. <laughs> uh, so we're looking at some of the, uh, some of the tokens now on, on, on the screen. Yeah, so um, all, of the, uh, all of the encounters in the, uh, in the game, whether they're random or intentional, they're either put directly on the map where you need them. So if you go into the, the grung camp, it's going to be full of the appropriate grungs. But if you need to find yourself some additional grungs or you want to put together a, a random encounter, all of the tokens are, uh, are put in here onto a, an individual screen. They're all statted out already mm -hmm. with their hit points, their armor class. Um, and then as well, you can pop open the character sheet just by shift clicking on them. And so this will give you the whole page, the, the same monster stat block you would get. It's going to give you uh, some GM notes about that. And then if you click on character sheet, it's going to flip us over to all of our rollable actions. So now we can use this screen for the Hydra to make strength checks, make saving throws, make attacks, roll initiative. Uh, and all of that is available from here. So you can mix and match the kind of mapped encounters. We did, uh, we did one recently, the, the aforementioned Assassin Vine battle. Uh, we did that without relying on the map because they're Assassin Vines. They're not going to be moving around a lot. Uh, and so we just did the, the theater of mind, but I popped over to one of these screens and I just used the Assassin Vine character sheet uh, on here uh, using the tools that the, the system gives me to track things like initiative. Um, and then we just narratively describe movement and, uh, and uh, effects of spells. Super cool. Yeah, I'm an incredibly lazy GM. Um, I, I am <laughs> not like, I, I don't have the, the time, honestly, anymore to do all of this myself. So if someone were to, to give me a, a physical copy of Tomb, I would look through it and I'd be like, this is amazing, I would love to play this, but I just, like, I don't have time to prep all these encounters, which is why I like the virtual tabletop version. I like the Roll20 version because it caters to my laziness. And what's been really fun is, uh, as, I've been, as I've been doing it, you know, you, it doesn't matter how long you work with a tool or how long you play a game, there will always be people who uh, have uh, little tips and tricks about it that you don't know. And so chat will mm -hmm. offer up like, hey, if you do this, then it will go faster. So like one example, um, there's a paragraph in Tomb about weather, but there isn't like a specific weather table. Uh, just make some suggestions. So a fan put together a weather macro. And so now every day I can say, looks like today it's misty. Mm. or tomorrow it's rainy. So every day before we start the encounter, I can just punch out the weather of Chult. And this is something that a, uh, a fan put together uh, for, for their uh, home campaign in, in Roll20 uh, and then just shared it with me. And the, the Roll20 forums are full of these kinds of things, helpful macros to uh, shorten the amount of time it takes to do things, uh, little tips and tricks for the OGL character sheet, um, and uh, things that appeal to a lazy game master like myself. <laughs> Well, we were talking about that uh, off the air beforehand. I, I would contend that anyone who's who's uh, DMing 21 hours a week is far far from uh, far from lazy. <laughs> fair. Right. Fair. That's true. That's true. Well, it depends Listen, on I just, your players. I don't have right? a lot of time to attend to any given thing. I'm doing so many things. So so anywhere that the the system can can smooth that out for me, uh, I'll take it. But but it is a. Uh, I suppose a truism. There's there's some some work and effort that goes into being a dungeon master, and and you know uh, we we try to make sure that the campaigns are are as easily run out of the cover to cover out of the box as, as possible.
possible. But having those added tools, uh, Rule 20 and, and the, the macros and, and the advice that you can turn to only makes the job that much uh, easier. Right. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, like I, I remember playing like this. This year is my my 25th anniversary of being a dungeon master. Um, and I remember when I first started uh, playing as a kid with the old second edition Forgotten Realms box set, the one that came with the the clear plastic overlay with the hexes on it, mm -hmm. and like counting hexes and seeing how long the the ship voyage from Waterdeep to Baldur's Gate is, and and having the time to do all of that that work. And certainly with uh, with Roll Twenty, you can still custom build your own you know your own content, your own dungeons, uh, apply the the dynamic lighting and building counter tables. Um, but but thankfully, in the case of Tomb of Annihilation, the hardworking folks in the engineering team have done all that work for me, and now I can just do my GM thing. <laughs> Speaking mm -hmm. of the the the, uh, the GM uh, thing, uh, you you mentioned the roundtable that you were participating in earlier yeah. this week. How, how did that go? What was uh, what were some of the topics that were brought up? And so this can was... folks see a vodcast of that somewhere? Yeah, 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 totally. So this is a uh, this is a, a now uh, the second time that we've we've done this. Uh, it was put together by. Uh, my producer for uh, for Roleplay, uh, the other the other show that I do, mm -hmm. and uh, yeah, and it's on uh, It Me JP either on YouTube mm -hmm. or or on Twitch. Um, and uh, yeah, we've done two now. It was uh, it was me, uh, Matt Colville, uh, Matthew Mercer, JP, and uh, and your your very own Mike Merles. Uh, and we uh, we just spent a couple of hours talking about Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and it's it's really interesting because the round table is an opportunity for a bunch of different viewpoints on D&D to kind of come together. Whenever I play a game on uh, on stream, I, I would say nine times out of 10, when I notice a design element or I, I see something interesting in the game, the first thing I say is, why did they do this? Why is this like this? This is really interesting. <laughs> What's the reason behind this? Yeah. And so back when we talked about doing the round table for the first time, I said, you know, I know, I know Mike Merles. We, we, we go way back as these things go. Uh, let's invite him on the show so that I can be like, yo, Mike, why did you do this this way? Uh, and then I can get Matt and Matt to, uh, to back me up. So it's, uh, yeah, it's been, it's been really fun. It's a, a little two hour. We did a little two hour one uh, last time. And of course, when you get a bunch of people who are really passionate about something uh, in a, a metaphorical room all at once, we went over by a half an hour uh, just because we were so excited to be talking about it. Um, but the goal behind the roundtable is just to give an audience uh, an idea of kind of the thought processes behind both running D and D, uh, treating it as a as a show, the way it might be different as a show than it might be at your table, uh, and then the interaction between the rules and the uh, and the game master. It, it's funny. I mean, yeah, there is that whole new facet of it. Uh, it's not just playing the game it, it, with Dungeons and Dragons, it's about creating material for the game. And with Twitch now, it's also that performance angle, not just for the folks around the table, but for, for a live audience as well. well. The round table is very much like behind the camera too, mm -hmm. right? So it's, it's, a, it's a, a deep look into the thought processes behind some of the, you know, the, the, the best people in the, the, the industry, right? So uh, I know I watched a, a, um, a little bit uh, previous to Previous to this, and mm -hmm. and, uh, and and certainly it's a a really interesting mix of people, right? Where where uh, um, Matt Mercer is is kind of like the leading edge of, of the performance mm -hmm. uh, side of it, how to take the rules and 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 you know put it into its final form, and Mike is completely on the other side where he's uh, looking at this massive possibilities and putting it into a, a context, mm -hmm. and then Matt Colville is is like that middle guy where he's trying to teach people how to get into the um, uh, into the the, the the hobby, so it's a uh, it's a super interesting mix of opinions and and uh, processes and and uh, and how to interpret things. Hmm. Well, we'll we'll definitely look forward to the next one. Uh, is there more planned in the future? I I feel like as long as people keep showing up, we'll we'll keep trying to do them. But as you, as you can imagine, uh, as with most things of this nature, scheduling is the is the nightmare, right? Finding finding a time to get all those those busy folks away from their you know, working on Dungeons and Dragons or running Critical Role time or having an incredibly <laughs> successful Kickstarter time. You know, we 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 don't have a set schedule for the roundtable just because we're like, all right, so we did number two. We'll see you in. X amount of months for number three when everybody is free, when the, the stars align. Um, but we definitely, yeah, we definitely want to continue the series. And for me, like all of this kind of came from 
just having a three hour long conversation about streaming and design with Mike at Gen Con. Mm -hmm. And now we can have that three hour conversation, but in front of an audience uh, and, uh, and impart some of that wisdom to, uh, to the crowd. And, and what about the Roll20 Presents campaign? We're, we're about in the, uh, in the Tomb of Annihilation campaign, are you? And, and what might be coming down the road in the next uh, couple of sessions? Without, you know, obviously spoiling it too much for-, for Sure, players. yeah. So we, we just entered what kind of feels to me like sort of season two, if you want to think of it that way, in that the characters are all approaching sixth level. Um, they've, they have learned of sort of the, the middle boss of the, of the campaign. Uh, and now they have, they have this massive stretch of, uh, hexagons to explore as they, uh, as they head south towards, uh, towards Omu. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's interesting because it's, it's hard to predict how long a, a campaign will go, but with the way that, uh, the tomb is structured, you can kind of look at the challenges that the players are ready for. And now I'm in a place where I'm, I'm ready to kind of bump them up to tier two to be like, all right, you're getting to be serious players in Schult. Let, let's see how you feel about taking on the one T necromancer. Um, so yeah, hopefully many more exciting adventures uh, ahead of them. I'm really hoping that we can find a fun sort of 12 plus level adventure so that we don't have to give up on these characters when we get to the end of tomb. Because I, I don't know about the audience, but I am <laughs> desperately attached to these characters, <laughs> which is ironic in an in adventure as deadly as Tomb. We'll see. We'll see if they all survive. And, and I suppose that I'm trying to craft the question the way that I'm trying to ask it. Uh, advice you might have, not just as a, a DM, a GM, for running and sustaining a successful campaign, but as a live streamer running and maintaining a successful show? Are, are there different skill sets? How do you manage those two things? How do you maintain the interest week to week for your players and for the audience? Yeah, so so for me, uh, I think that this this group, um, you know, we, we do Roll20 Presents a little differently than, say, I do role play. With role play, we're very much assembling a cast for a show. We'll think about it in terms of doing a season, we'll have guests, and we'll, we'll plan it out like we're planning a TV show. It's much more a production that happens to be powered by Dungeons & Dragons. Uh, whereas I think that our experience with Roll20 Presents is a lot more like your average group in that it's you and your friends who like RPGs, and you'll play different adventures and different characters with them, but the group sticks together. Um, and I think, depending on kind of where you're at, if you have people who are interested in the game and interested in taking it to a place where you're, you're streaming it, um, they're gonna wanna play the game because they wanna play the game. The streaming thing adds on a, another level. Um, if they're folks who wanna stream, first and foremost, there is that buy-in, that like, okay, we're gonna play D&D, &D, and that's an important part of the show, so you know, y'all are interested in learning, and you can build the show around that. Um, I think that's the that's the trick. I've I've actually found it easier to maintain momentum with a weekly sort of externally oriented show than I might with a, a group at home because with your home group if somebody doesn't feel like playing or they have a wedding to go to or they just don't feel like it the only people they're really beholden to are the rest of the group but we we have several thousand people who are going to be like hey where's the episode this week why where is we miss we miss Ishi Snaggletooth what happened? So being beholden to our audience uh, is both uh, a bit more of a responsibility, right? We have that, that responsibility to show up every week and entertain them, but also uh, it's super inspiring. Like we show up every week because we get to entertain you. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that makes the players really passionate. So if you can find a group of people that are passionate, not only about killing monsters with swords and getting treasure, but doing so for, uh, for an audience, right? Showing them how much fun D&D is and, and really treating them like a participant in your game to some degree or another. Uh, that's, uh, that's the key for me to success is being passionate about it as a show and as a game. Hmm. Well, uh, again, thank you for well, uh, th thank you uh, for for having the uh, the time to jump on the the Dragon Plus live stream and talk through My a bit pleasure. of Rule Twenty Rule Twenty presents again. Normally streams Fridays one to five p.m. on the D and D channel. Uh, they streamed on Monday this week for scheduling uh, circumstances, but they will be back uh, next week as as usual. We look, we're looking forward to it. Uh, if, if folks want to find out more about uh, Roll Twenty Presents, about your other your other work, your other groups, uh, where where would they be able to to head and find out that information? Yeah, the the best place if they want to see anything that I'm doing uh, is either uh, Twitch.tv/AdamCoble. 
Uh, it's my my Twitch channel uh, or on Twitter. I'm uh, I'm Skinny Ghost uh, over there, and that's sort of the the central hub for all the stuff that I that I GM. Uh, obviously, if they want to check out the module for themselves, uh, they can go to roll20.net. Uh, the module and all of the other stuff that we use for the show is in uh, in the marketplace. Well, uh, again, thanks for uh, for joining us. I'll just uh, wrap with a couple of quick announcements for, for the audience. Again, uh, thank you for everyone viewing, and uh, special thanks to our followers and subscribers. If you haven't followed or subscribed, please consider doing so. We greatly appreciate it. Uh, we will be coming back. We'll take a short break at 3 o'clock, but we will be returning at 3.30 with D&D News with Greg Tito. And, of course, at uh, 4 p.m. Pacific with the next episode of Dice Camera Action and Chris Perkins as, as our DM. A uh, quick couple of programming notes. Speaking of live streams, we will have Holly Conrad will be debuting her live stream, Trapped in the Birdcage, uh, starting next Thursday from 5 to 7 p.m. Pacific. And the return of Heroes Graveyard on Saturday, uh, February 24th, uh, 6 to 9, following Encounter Roleplay, Learn by Play. Uh, encounter role plays, learn by play, their last session. And again, I know, I know Obo Crazy is in the chat, uh, and she has been giving us some awesome recaps uh, here as she's been following the group. So thank you, uh, Lauren Obo Crazy. Uh, so the last uh, learn by play, the group finally named themselves uh, the Wild Card, survived a fight with the Tabaxi Zentarum. And our doo -doo -doo, uh, Will, uh, speaking of uh, a bit of uh, education for, for live streamers and Dungeon Masters in particular, uh, the Learn by Play uh, group also tries to, to, to break from time to time uh, and will uh, give a bit of, of, uh, of some of the lessons for what they're doing for uh, how, how to fit the game uh, into, into uh, how to fit the, what they're doing into, into your game. So. Look for that. As always, Saturdays, 3 to 6 p.m., followed by Heroes Graveyard, 6 to 9 p.m. Cool. Uh, again, Mr. File, thank you for joining us, as always, and uh, speaking with uh, Stephen, Stephen Wark over at Ludia. Yep. Uh, and for folks that might have missed the first segment, their, their new game just announced. Right. That's Warriors Waterdeep. Um, you can go to www.warriorswaterdeep.com, I believe. They I managed to grab that, that URL <laughs> and, um, uh, and, uh, um, and uh, check that out. Uh, Pre-register, you can get the free Laryl Silver Pack or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and no, it's super good. I've been playing early builds. Very cool game, really good art. Uh, I'm very, very excited about it coming out. Uh, next week on the Dragon Plus live stream, we will be talking to Matt Chapman from Dialect as we lead into our next issue release. We'll be doing an extensive preview, and I believe we'll have a guest from uh, Bcom, Bcom yeah. as well. And Chris Dupuy, I think. Yes, Chris Dupuy will be yeah. taking your seat. Right. Uh, so again, uh, Adam, thank you so much for, for joining us, and uh, to My all pleasure. of our viewers, uh, thank you uh, for, for tuning in. Adam, we'll look forward to seeing you next Friday for Roll20 Presents. Excellent. See you then. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.